Um, uh, Jim Scott, welcome to the podcast. Pleased to be here. Um, so you are one of the great critics of the state and of a particular kind of top-down view in which the state tends to uh, conceptualize the world within social science. For those of us who think that the state can often do many good things, that things like the welfare state are one of the great achievements of uh, modernity, that perhaps many of the solution, many of the problems we see in society uh, might be solved in part by government action. Uh, why should we be skeptical of this state? Oh, first of all, uh, let's notice that something like the Danish welfare state uh, has been around for perhaps 35 years uh, maximum. Um, and uh, states that took their population's welfare at all seriously have been around only since, if you like, the Bismarckian state of uh, Prussia. Um, I think that was the beginning of a state that tried to systematically understand the health, uh, longevity, and so on of its population. So the point is that for almost all of human history, uh, one has been dealing with a quite different state uh, whose uh, objective was to extract uh, as much wealth, grain, taxes, and manpower from the population as possible, and to help support uh, forms of uh, uh, bonded labor or slavery. And so uh, you think that that, that 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 is, in a way, the more typical form that the state has taken. Um, do you think that still should inform how we think about even relatively benevolent states like the Danish one now? Um, or uh, have we managed to overcome well, that legacy, at least in some parts of the world? So I guess the question for me, uh, I, again, I'm, although I call myself a sort of half-assed anarchist, um, I'm, uh, uh, and that's why the book that I wrote was called Two Cheers for Anarchism, not Three Cheers. Uh, I don't imagine we're going to abolish the state. But the thing to remember about the welfare state and the emancipatory things it does, is that it has only done that with the pistol at its temple. Uh, that is to say, the French Revolution, right? Um, eliminated the estates and created the idea of equal citizenship, right? The New Deal was um, essentially um, an effort to save um, the capitalism from revolutionary pressures from below because of the depression. Uh, and so it seems to me that, yes, do states make em emancipatory moves? Yes, they do, but they only do it with a pistol at their temple. And we should understand that that's how such emancipatory moves take place. So it seems to me there's definitely strands to the critique you outline. One is uh, telling us about what the nature of a state was for much of its history. Another is how even sometimes when uh, the state tries to do good, it actually does anything but. So perhaps we can take uh, those pieces as, as background and then move into some of the more contemporary questions. So, um, sure. uh, you know, you write about the origins of modern states in uh, Against the Grain, among other works. Um, how does a state come to be and what can we learn from the early history of a state? <clears throat> that's, um, that's a big question. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. This uh, podcast is all about big questions, and we invite guests who are capable of answering them, even if they're unfair. So, um, yes. Uh, the first thing I suppose to notice, uh, first of all, uh, I make the same argument I made about the state, but even on a longer time frame, that the state, um, uh, if we think of the state as the earliest states as walled towns with kings and tax collectors and artisans and a small army, uh, then we're talking about something that came into existence roughly three millennia before Christ, right? That is to say, not more than five millennia ago. And Homo sapiens has been around, right, for 200,000 years. 
Um, so the state appeared, if you like, at five minutes to midnight, if you like, if we take uh, that as an entire day. Uh, and so it's a late invention. And all of the states that we are familiar with, um, almost without exception, there are a couple of interesting exceptions, um, but they all occurred in floodplain land, uh, lowlands, uh, where there was, um, uh, if you like, because of the flood pulse of a river, there was nutritious soil provided every year as the flood retreated after killing all the weeds and putting down nutrition. It was the only place in the world where you could have concentrated grain and concentrated population such that it was possible to make a state and control both the manpower and grain and surplus that a state needs. And, and, and so, so, so it's very interesting to learn about where the state originates. Um, how do you evaluate that change? First of all, I know that there's a sort of lively debate about whether uh, actually human be beings were better off before they formed uh, these political entities, which often came along with deep hierarchies, deep forms of social control. Um, and there's an argument about whether they were economically better off before they did that as well. Um, uh, you, you know, as somebody who is ambivalent about the state, who, you know, has two cheers for anarchism, but uh, or for anarchy, but not free, um, uh, you know, how do you, how would you describe the transformation of the lives of the residents of those early states? Oh, if, if we're talking about the early state, uh, then it seems to me, um, uh, Steven Pinker to the contrary, notwithstanding, um, that it, uh, it's, the answer is simple. Uh, life was better for hunters and gatherers than it was for subjects in the early state. That's absolutely clear. It's clear in the physical remains, um, uh, on the in the bones, if you like. Um, if you, uh, the bones of people in the early agricultural states show more signs of malnutrition uh, and interruptions in growth uh, because of that malnutrition, mostly iron deficiency, by the way. Um, and if you find uh, the skeletons of people in living in hunting and gathering and foraging societies, um, uh, their skeletons, they're, they're bigger, for one thing, fewer interruptions in growth, uh, and they show very little sign uh, ever of any uh, malnutrition. Uh, or uh, vitamin deficiency. So the diet in the early states was um, uh, not good for your health. Um, and, and in a sense, all of those states, I should add, there's a whole chapter devoted in that book to the, that, the, that fact, and that is that all of the states, the early states are grain states, right? They require a staple of grain that can be grown in a concentrated way. And um, the hunters and gatherers we're talking about, one has this idea of, let's say, Mesopotamia, where the earliest states arose by and large, as because it became much later a very arid area uh, that could only be farmed because of irrigation. But at the time in which these states were established, it was a wetland. The, the, the sea level was another 300 feet higher than it is today. And uh, the people who lived in that area had many different ecological zones to move between. So they didn't have to work very hard. And the thing I want to say about hunters and gatherers is that we should never see them as people who get up in the morning, walk out into the forest and hope to find a bird or an animal to throw a spear at. Um, almost all of the hunting that takes place uh, is time to the migrations, to the natural migrations of game animals. So the way to think about this is to think about the salmon runs in the Pacific Northwest, which was the richest area before agriculture you could possibly imagine. And it was because um, in two weeks, um, the people uh, taking, taking their nutrition from the runs of salmon, in two weeks, they could get the protein that they needed for the whole year. So the fact is that even contemporary hunters and gatherers don't spend an eight hour day um, getting their nutrition. 
they spend about half their time working on, uh, if you like, subsistence. So they are not, if you like, uh, a day away from starvation at all. That's, that's, that's fascinating. That sounds like a nice life. You, you know, first up by the river for two weeks a year and then you eat salmon for the rest of the day. That sounds a little bit like my pandemic, actually. Mine is the right, right. salmon myself. Yeah. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little, but there are major sources of proteins. You know, so for in, Mes in Mesopotamia, there were gazelle migrations. And by building a kind of, if you like, a sluice with um, uh, not stone, but brush and so on, they could create a channel, a funnel that, that, that funneled the gazelles when they came by into a killing ground. And so it was essentially like a river of gazelles rather than a river of salmon. Um, and so uh, the, the rhythm of, um, I mean, it, uh, it's not just natural migrations of game animals, but also the fruiting of, um, of trees with nuts and trees with fruits. If you're there at the right time uh, and you are attuned to all of those rhythms, it's not a lot of work providing the population is not uh, excessive and providing that you have lots of ecological zones, wet, wet areas, dry areas uh, and seasonal differences. So this is presumably one of the differences that in the early states, the population expands a lot. So for the lives, uh, and I may be mistaken, but that's my understanding. So, so the lives of each member of these early states may have been um, harsher than the lives of their ancestors, but these states were able to sustain real growth of the human population. Um, uh, what happens then? So you're saying, look, like if you're in the early states, life is clearly less good. My understanding is that then from the early states, there's only very limited economic growth for thousands of years, right? Um, so, so, so to what extent does the image you describe still apply in medieval Europe or in uh, the China of uh, 1000 uh, uh, AD or in different parts of the world, you know, until let's say uh, 1700? Well, if you're, if, if you're talking about population growth, right? Um, we have the same thing, um, the same phenomenon we've talked about in, two, in other contexts already. And that is that um, in 1750, which is not so very long ago, the, popu the world population was only three quarters of a billion. And it's now uh, going on eight billion. Um, so it, the point is that Yes, the population expanded, it grew, but it grew very, very slowly for the longest possible time. And that curve, you know, is one of those famous hockey stick curves in which um, it uh, goes up dramatically uh, only uh, by the, after the 17th century and so on. And the, if you like the fossil fuel revolution. The, the question is, I suppose, it is, it is true, of course, that uh, those, the extraction of the, the, the use of the floodplain to commandeer a productive population growing uh, a surplus, um, to use it as taxes created all the beautiful things we like to see in museums, right? Of the monumental centers of these places and the artisanal products and idols and statues uh, and so on. Um, and so that is a, a product of, if you like, the extraction of a surplus by a population. And it, I make it clear, and I think it is absolutely clear that all of these early states had a population problem of keeping that population in place because it was exploited uh, in conscription. It was exploited for its uh, surplus, for unfree labor and so on. And so all of the warfare of early, early states was what I call um, a capture warfare, right? Um, not, it was not about territory, uh, except in special places where there was a bottleneck and trade routes that it, it was important to control. But aside from that, all of the wars were wars of capture in which the effort was to maintain a population 
for the following reasons. First of all, people were leaking away. Uh, you had flight. Sometimes if a famine uh, or epidemic, um, it leaked away in a hemorrhage, uh, but it would dribble away uh, as well. Um, and um, as a result of that, this population had to be systematically replaced and it was replaced by wars of capture. So the Athenians, right? 70% of the population of Athens are slaves. And those slaves are captured by Athenian military. Uh, and they, in a sense, they're, when they capture a place, uh, they march, especially the women and children back, uh, because they also have a reproductive problem. That is to say, they, they, they want to capture men and, well, excuse me, women and children, especially. And they want to capture the women, not just because they are, if you like, labor, um, or wives for that matter, um, but they are captured for the reproductive services that they help to solve the population problem. And so, um, uh, so when you think of these sort of early exploitative states um, of people having relatively poor nutrition in them, with war being the central element of, of, of capture uh, rather than conquest, um, and when you fast forward, um, uh, you know, for a long time, you have some population growth, but not that much population growth, some economic growth, but not that much uh, economic growth. Uh, then you wind up having a quite different set of states that arise in the early modern period. Um, and I feel like there's a different work of yours that's particularly uh, uh, relevant to, 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 to that time period, which is seeing like a state and your critique of the ways in which those states tried to rationalize their territory uh, remake their populations and uh, and their social world. Um, uh, right. What what is wrong with what you call the sort of modernist vision? Why is that? Why does that create a different kind of problem that we should be concerned about? Um, a modernist vision uh, it depends on how, if you like, extreme it is. That is to say, um, the um, the modernist vision requires for its, uh, what I call high modernism, for its most extreme uh, examples, um, a, uh, the absence of the restraining factors of, if you like, democratic social organization, uh, resistance, uh, and when it, it, what you get in a sense, if you like, Good example is Russia after the First World War, um, in which it was a, if you like, defeated, although not conquered, um, uh, and a, a collapsed civil society, and if you like, a government, the Bolsheviks, uh, with a very modernist idea uh, taken from the Germans actually during the First World War about the administrative state. Um, and and my, my argument, as you know, perhaps, I, I start off that book with my example of scientific forestry. Uh, and the reason why scientific forestry is a good example is because once you take some complicated natural phenomenon like a forest and reduce it to so many cubic feet of firewood and lumber, uh, and manage it for that purpose. And, and if you like cultivate it like the row crops of a grain field, um, you destroy all the ecological processes in the forest uh, and open that forest to disease and collapse uh, and so on. And so there's, in a sense, to take a natural phenomenon and reduce it to a one commodity machine, if you like, uh, is almost certainly to violate each ecological processes that we don't understand and that have then um, dramatically negative effects over the long run. <laughs> and, and so this is an example of how uh, an attempt to rationalize the world, an attempt to say, hey, we have all these forests, but we're not really using in a rational way. And here's a, a way of thinking about um, you know, how you compare different forests to each other. 
how you compare what we might be able to get out of them to each other and how we then create mechanisms for making sure that we exploit them as best as possible uh, wind up being counterproductive and wind up failing in all kinds of different ways. Um, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on uh, uh, a more urban example of this. I was thinking a lot about your book when I was traveling briefly in Brazil two years ago when I went to Brasilia, which is, uh, you know, beloved by architects around the world. Um, it looks beautiful in models. Um, but when I was there, I was really struck by how it just did not work at all as an urban environment. Um, you know, they have a, a huge central mall uh, modeled a little bit on the one in Washington DC perhaps, but much, much larger, which was meant to be the space for political engagement, but it's so big, but you know, even if the giant protest just looks lost within it, um, you know, they have these um, housing blocks um, where the idea was that one raised stilts and people could uh, assemble underneath them in order to have political debates. But of course, uh, who uses these weird uh, windswept, uh, spaces uh, underneath the houses, uh, you know, drug dealers and criminals and so on. So it's sort of, you know, one example after the other in the city of how a very utopian vision of a progressive vision of uh, what a city might look like um, has sort of gone wrong in each each state. Um, t tell us a little bit about how that fits into the kind of so problems you're interested in. For me, the surprising, in the course of writing, um, seeing like a state, uh, and that's why I use the verb to see uh, in the title, in a sense. Um, is I was struck again and again by the mistaken assumption that visual order is synonymous with uh, efficiency uh, and working order. Uh, and my favorite quote is from Jane Jacobs, who was interested in more complicated cities and how they worked. And her point was that the intestines of a rabbit might look like a mess, but they are perfectly designed for doing what they do. Uh, her other example was the city desk in an urban newspaper um, uh, office. Um, uh, and uh, so that in a sense, the Brasilia is, um, and that's the problem with a certain kind of architecture, that the, the visual order is the order that is seen from a helicopter, right? Uh, as opposed to experienced by people who actually live uh, on the ground. Um, and it, all the things that we love, uh, those of us who live in cities love about, I don't actually have a farm, but uh, those of us who live in cities, um, love this mixture of uh, mixed use of complicated neighborhoods that are visually interesting, that have all the services, the petty bourgeoisie, the bar, the, the, the restaurant, the sort of park benches, uh, the bakeries and so on, that make a city a kind of um, interesting place to live. The interesting thing also about Le Corbusier uh, and because he, although he wasn't as Da Costa who, who designed um, Brasilia, uh, but it was in the Le Corbusier, if you like, um, ideological vision. What was interesting is that like Bauhaus, um, uh, it was a, an architecture for an abstract human being. Uh, that is to say a human being who could be anywhere, who needed so many, square feet um, per person who needed so much fresh water, who needed so much sunlight, who needed so much outdoor space. Um, that is to say, what's, what's interesting is that it's the assumption that uh, people were, if you like, uh, units rather than bearers of culture, aesthetics, uh, and so on. Uh, and so there is not even the slightest reference, if you like, to the history of the, um, if you like, the Portuguese, um, you know, square with the market and the church and the, uh, and so on. So it, what's interesting is that it was, if you like, designed for a abstract human being rather than a Brazilian, let alone someone from Sao Paulo, right, or Rio. That's, that's fascinating. And there's, um, it, 
Good. You know, there was a, it didn't, it was just worth saying that I don't know much about it, but there was a, a, a kind of psychological um, illness that was called Brazil, Bra, uh, Brasilia-itis, um, that was the depression that people went into because all there was in Brasilia was essentially home and uh, and the office. The, uh, but as you know, what's interesting, Brasilia became more interesting, uh, partly, and everything that became more interesting was the unplanned Brasilia that people invented in the process of trying to make a possible, a plausible life in Brasilia. So uh, I think cities are a great sort of prism into this larger critique of state planning and what works about it and what doesn't. So, so let me push another comparison. Um, you know, there's an easy contrast to be made between Brasilia and, you know, a city like, like Rome in Europe or, um, uh, you know, a city like perhaps uh, Bangkok in, in Asia, um, you know, cities that have grown up organically over time with some amount of planning, of course, but um, which perhaps uh, uh, in a positive sense uh, resemble the intestines of a rabbit more closely than they do the sort of hyper-planned mm. um, nature of Brasilia. What about cities like New York, which are on a grid? Uh, they are quite deeply planned cities, actually, um, and yet they feel much more organic, much more lively, like they have this kind of mix of life uh, that you were evoking. Did something go right in the planning there or is the sort of force of humanity in a place like New York so strong that it has overpowered the planning and rehumanized it like the most interesting parts of Brasilia that you were talking about? I'm, I'm, I'm not a uh, New York A, so um, uh, uh, although I've spent a fair amount of time in New York. The interesting thing about New York from my perspective is that it's a hybrid city. That is to say, south of Wall Street, and Wall Street is where the wall of the original Dutch village uh, was located. Um, uh, New York below Wall Street is not a grid. A Manhattan below Wall Street is not a grid, right? Uh, right. It's, 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 it, it, the, the architecture, of, well, the, 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 the basic plan of it is much more like a European city for that reason, it, yes. Exactly. And, and it actually was extremely desirable as a place to live because of its, um, uh, it wasn't, it, it was an organic, more, it, it grew more organically without straight lines of a grid. Whereas New York above Wall Street is the city you would design if you gave a child a ruler and a blank piece of paper and said, design for me a city with the sort of numbers of avenues and numbers of streets, you know. So if you want to find somebody, if you're the police and you want to find somebody on the Upper East Side, it's pretty easy to sort of find where someone is. You want to find someone in Fez or Meknes uh, in an ancient sort of Islamic um, uh, city or in Bruges, which is the other example I give, um, uh, then you kind of need a local tracker. And so in a sense, I think, and it, it is true, I think, I mean, Philadelphia was good, or Chicago, good example of grid cities. Uh, and that's part of the enlightenment idea, right? Of uh, having a, a lucid, um, um, legible, um, easily navigated, uh, easily navigated city. And some, there are Midwestern cities in which, uh, you know, there are streets or avenues that are numbered. And then the streets that cross are uh, the succession of US presidents from Washington all the way to Roosevelt. Um, and, you know, I get lost around the Civil War when the names, right? I don't know who comes after whom, uh, but it, it's meant to be to have exactly that kind of, uh, of order. I'm, I'm, I'm wandering away a little bit, but notice, notice that the way in which we've messed with the rivers is the same way. So, you know, you take a river like the Rhine and you turn it into a canal so that ships can pass going both ways of a particular depth, a particular width, um, uh, if you like, like a, like a, a superhighway, but for ships, right? Um, or 
you make it into a set of hydroelectric dams, uh, you uh, build levees so that it doesn't occupy its floodplain. So you take a river that sings many, many tunes, if it's left alone, and you uh, straightjacket that river or amputate it or uh, um, I think um, a taxidermy is a word that's often used as well. Uh, you have it sing one song and the result actually is a river that in the final analysis doesn't work. So you get, for example, the 1993 flood of the Mississippi or 1927 flood. And these are floods that are caused by all of the previous interventions in the river that are overwhelmed in a big flood, right? Um, and so- Well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me push back on this a little bit, right? So, because the question that I'm asking myself is, um, you know, I, I have learned a tremendous amount from your work and, and I take these critiques very seriously, but at the same time, we're now stuck in modern states. Um, and it doesn't seem possible to uh, avoid planning altogether. And I'm struck uh, that actually some of these uh, things work very well. I love New York City and uh, I love the part above Wall Street today more than the part below Wall Street that may have something to do with the different activities that are going on in, you know, lower Manhattan and, you know, something right. a few blocks above that, like um, the village or something like that. Um, uh, but even when you talk about straightjacketed uh, rivers uh, or amputated rivers, uh, when you think of something like the Suez Canal, it is an incredibly important lifeblood of a global economy. Um, and it turns out to be incredibly functional. In, in fact, we had this little drama uh, a little while ago with uh, this ship getting stuck in the Suez Canal and people thought, my God, this is going to uh, destroy the global economy and they'll never be able to move the ship. Um, but actually it took them, I believe, seven or eight days in the end. Um, and and they were able to to float the ship and um, uh, you know once again this canal uh, provides this really crucial service uh, to 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 the global economy. So I guess the question that I'm trying to push on is, um, you know, how should we think about planning in contemporary societies? Because I'm very persuaded by your work about the ways in which that can go badly wrong, but I also don't see a way out of it. So is the lessons about how to plan what's what's what can we learn about how to um, sure. uh, how to act? It's a good question. Um, so, if uh, to go back to your experience in Brasilia itself, if the planning has anything to do with creating a satisfactory life for the people who live within the plan, uh, then you should pay attention to what they want, right? And they should be part of the planning process. That is to say, if you think of the modern state creating low cost housing um, for poor people in Chicago and in New Haven, New Haven's a great example, by the way, of, of, of absolutely modernist planning gone desperately wrong for a long time. They got it right now, but uh, the point is that the public housing that they created was so monolithic and so dead and so unrelated to the life world of the people for whom it was planned that they tore it to pieces. And finally, uh, it had to be all torn down and they had to start from zero. So the, and, and also planning should be, you have, to, you have to lose the view that visual order equals working order. So for example, in West Africa, people grew four or five crops on the same land at the same time with certain things shading others and so on. And to the British um, colonialists uh, and agricultural specialists, this looked like really primitive kind of agriculture. And so they tore it all up and had monocropping, um, which is, efficient for certain, certain reasons, but they ended up degrading the soil. And after 30 years of this fuck up, if you don't mind the expression, they decided to do scientific tests of the productivity of the traditional agriculture compared to the agriculture that they had imposed as modern agriculture. And they, it found, they found that the traditional agriculture was uh, more productive, right? Even in scientific terms. So that it seems to me that 
one should never assume that visual order without uh, empirically, um, if you like, um, documenting it, right, by research um, equals uh, equals working order. Now, if if actually it's kind of interesting. I, I'm 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 not against things like the Suez Canal. Uh, that is to say, one there was, as you know. I think in the uh, 18th and early 19th century, there was this enormous canal bubble in which everyone in the world was building canals with the idea, since the way in which freight was moved around was prior to railroads was on rivers, uh, that's the most efficient way. That the result of that was that if you could connect the Danube and the Rhine, the Rhone and the Rhine, if you could connect to watersheds, you had a sort of much larger market, you can move goods more cheaply. Uh, and so it seems to me that canal building is creating connections that did not previously exist by modern engineering. And I, I can't off the top of my head uh, see any, I'm sure it had unintended consequences of water levels and tides uh, that I don't know about, but um, it seems to me that by and large, it had no um, uh, drastic negative consequences. How do you feel about um, urban development around the world at the moment? Which is to say that when I think about where um, uh, urban growth has taken place over the last decades, to some extent population growth, so that's uh, less the case uh, in, in China. Um, it feels like two very different stories. I really don't know anything about this, so I may be completely off. But in Africa, where we obviously have huge population growth, a lot of it seems to be in um, you know, unplanned developments and to some extent slums in you know, places uh, uh, like Nairobi, for example, and places like Lagos um, and many other cities around the continent. And a lot of people would look at that and say, well, there's no visual order. Um, you know, a lot of these houses don't have running water or electricity. Um, uh, this is this is terrible. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, you have the rise of the new uh, Asian megacities, particularly in China. Um, you know, many second, third tier cities, which probably um, aren't even particularly well known to many listeners of this podcast, um, but that have millions of people in them. And that often are hyper planned, right? When you look at uh, right. them, they have, you know, whatever it is, a hundred different settlements in the city and each settlement is a huge number of uh, high rise buildings. It really looks like they're sort of, um, you know, uh, an architect somewhere just thinking up and dreaming up the whole city. Um, should we be more concerned about what life may turn out to look like and feel like in these relatively planned and quite affluent uh, Asian super cities? And should we be relatively less concerned than, than many are about uh, what the sort of long-term legacy of uh, these unplanned developments in places like Lagos or Nairobi are? Because my instinct is still to say, well, um, even for one of them looks quite lively and, and, and fun and engaging in all kinds of ways, and the other looks um, uh, perhaps quite stark and, and a little dystopian, um, you know, the amount of amenities that is available in each, the amount of affluence that they reflect, the kinds of opportunities that people in them have is, is so vastly different um, that, that, that we shouldn't lament these sort of Asian megacities too much relative to over disadvantage, disadvantages that you would encounter in uh, an unplanned development in Lagos or Nairobi. So um, uh, again, I should start by a disclaimer of the fact that my life has been devoted to peasants and agriculture uh, more than to uh, uh, urban planning and urban history. Uh, so I'm a little out of my depth, but oh well, I have written about cities after all. And it seems to me that one of the best examples, um, it's a complicated story. Uh, let, let, let us take, for example, Singapore. Um, and under, and Singapore is actually a model for China back uh, to some considerable degree. So that Singapore decided um, this would be at the end of the, in the 60s um, under Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, they probably built more new housing than any city of its size anywhere in the world at the time, right? Um, and 
uh, like Baron Hausmann in Paris. Um, it had lots of good public health uh, results that as people had cleaner water, uh, they had larger uh, apartments, living space, they had sewage, um, uh, indoor toilets, um, and kind of playgrounds and so on. So um, yes, there were public health and uh, sanitation results that were um, completely positive. On the other hand, the design, and this was true for Hausmann too, by the way, in 1850s Paris, the design was intended to break up Malay and Chinese uh, clan areas and Indian areas and to disperse all of these ethnic and lineage groups over the public housing uh, landscape so that they became completely dependent on the People's Action Party for whether you got into preschool, whether you got public welfare, whether you got uh, certain government subsidies and so on. So it was a plan that did two things at the same time. It improved public health and it atomized the population so that it could be more successfully controlled in a granular way by the People's Action Party. Uh, and it was a success in both respects. So, um, you know, you, uh, is that better? Um, abstractly, uh, I guess this is, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Jane Jacobs idea of unslumming. And her argument was that if you provide jobs and provide insurance and loans, that what looks like a slum will gradually become a non-slum, right? Um, because people will improve their housing, uh, they'll have access to loans, they'll have insurance and so on. And uh, it seems to me that what I would prefer, let's say, if you take Mexico City or Lima or any of the West African large cities or Nairobi, as you say, right? Uh, it'd be interesting actually to compare, if you like, a new city um, uh, and how it functions in terms of the human satisfaction that it provides, as opposed to a city that takes an existing slum and works steadily to upgrade it uh, so that it's not this right to provide sewage to provide water and so on um, and so it seems to me that that um, here's the point that and if you think of I'm thinking of this with respect to Burmese universities today uh, and Parisian universities after 1968 the effort was to take institutions that were seen as a threat to public order because they were radical institutions and to atomize them and spread them into, instead of the Sorbonne, you had Paris one, two, three, four, five scattered all over in the suburbs uh, and much of the third world, including Burma has spread their universities into uh, outlying areas in which you have to take, take a bus to the university. So a lot of public housing has a undeclared purpose of uh, social control uh, and the prevention of uh, organized dissent. Hmm. The, um, the idea of unslumming is, is, is really interesting. And actually, even when you think of Asian cities, um, of course, in many of those cities, the most desirable areas now are the former hutongs, uh, which right. certainly were right. the poor areas i don't know that they were ever exactly slums but they're the closest equivalent i can think of and they've and torn down a lot of them and they've a lot torn of them down, down, down but the ones that still right. exist and that have been renovated and equipped with desirable. running water and electricity are now extremely desirable be precisely because they have many of those um aspects of comparatively unplanned order rather than the sort of super planned order so it's a hopeful vision to think that perhaps some areas right. of these rising african megacities 
uh, may wind up with 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 the same possibility. You mentioned Burma a moment ago. I have to say one of the thing, one of the many things I admire about you is that as a not entirely young man, you started to uh, learn uh, uh, Burmese and started to work on on on, on the country, and you have. Um, uh, a significant work uh, on the country coming out relatively soon, as I understand. Um, what have you been working on with respect to the country? And then perhaps uh, after you tell us about that, I'd love to hear uh, your assessment of um, uh, the both dire, but also in some ways inspiring political situation in the country today. Thanks. The the first, um, <clears throat> I'm. Uh, it's a long story, and I I won't um, I won't. Uh, give you the details, but it's more or less a mistake that made me into a Southeast Asianist. Uh, and I, 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 would, probably... I will insist on the details of that story. <laughs> well, oh, okay. Um, I was a scholarship student at Williams College, um, and uh, I was doing an economics honors thesis on German wartime mobilization. It turned out that during the Second World War, the Germans did not have second and triple shifts, even when they had the population early in the war. Uh, and the question what I was supposed to solve was why they didn't. In any case, um, I, I, for, to make a long story short, I fell in love and didn't do any work in my first semester of my senior year on the thesis and the my advisor, who was a quite brilliant man, um, saw through my efforts to fake um, uh, how much work I'd done and told me to get out and uh, he wasn't going to advise me. Uh, and so I, if I wanted to graduate with honors in economics, I had to find someone who would adopt me. And I just knocked systematically on every door in the economics department. And I found someone who said, uh, who worked on Indonesia, but he said, I'd like to know something about Burmese economic development. If you'll work on Burmese economic development, I will adopt you. Um, and I did. So I did a, uh, did a dissertation on uh, Burmese economic plans. In any case, um, I would have studied uh, in graduate school. I went to Burma for a year uh, on a fellowship um, right after college. Um, and I would have worked on Burma, except that it closed up and I wouldn't have been able to do field work. I would have done China, but I couldn't do field work there. Um, so finally, um, I decided to work on Malay language because Malay is spoken in Indonesia, Burma, uh, uh, Malay is spoken in Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and the Philippines. So I knew one of these countries I could do research in. Um, and that's how I worked in Malay villages right, for quite some time. Uh, and then I decided I wanted to go back to Burma when it opened. And that's why I've been working on, uh, on Burma. And um, I don't quite know why. Um, I, I, it's still a fairly uh, militarized country so that when I was there and traveling with friends, um, we would occasionally be barred from certain places and people would ask me what I was doing. And I, uh, I've always been interested in rivers from canoeing and fishing and so on. And so I, my excuse to wherever I was found was that I was studying the Irrawaddy River because wherever I was, was either close to the Irrawaddy or close to a tributary. And so I had an all purpose excuse uh, and uh, it gradually became a kind of passion to sort of understand uh, this river that's the lifeblood of Burmese culture, if you like. Um, and so I, I hope to write a biography of the river, maybe even in the first person, as if the river speaks, right? And, and, not, and so it will not be a history of Homo sapiens and the river. It'll be a history of the river if you like, told by the river starting in geological time uh, and working up to the present. Uh, because I think my, my students, um, they tend to think of a river as just so much H2O that has to be divided up between different claimants, right? And as a resource, essentially. And they don't think about all of the life forms whose 
whose life world depends on the river, like the fish and the crabs and the, and the and the water birds and so on. So I want to tell a different river story than the usual river story. Uh, and as I indicated before we began, I'm deeply involved now in trying to support the Burmese democratic uh, protesters who uh, are protesting against the military uh, coup uh, that took place on February the 1st. So, so tell us a little bit about the political background here. I think one of the strange ironies, but I noticed when we were trying to commission a piece about uh, Burma for, for persuasion, um, is that because the country has been closed down for so long, it is actually very difficult to, um, to, to understand much about the country. It's difficult, for example, you know, I have connections to activists from many different parts of the world. I don't know many Burmese activists. Um, you know, I have friends who have lived in many countries around the world. I don't have any friends who have lived in um, Myanmar. Um, and so there's a strange irony where, you know, how long the country has been closed down makes it, in fact, more difficult for people outside the country to understand it and to get the stakes of what's going on there. So if you will tell us a little bit about uh, the, the military regime there, the ways in which it has been challenged over the last decade um, and how it then took control again a few months ago at this point. Sure, um, you're absolutely right um, that uh, I think, you know, along with places like Bhutan, and so on, you could argue that it may be, it's certainly the least known country in Southeast Asia. Um, and from essentially uh, Burma actually withdrew from Cold War politics um, under military rule from 1962 or even, um, even before that, even the parliamentary period. Uh, it, it did not become involved in the Cold War on either, either side over time. The military took over and has ruled actually essentially from 1962 until today. So we're talking, right, uh, 60 years of military rule, even though it was shared with the elected parliament for the last 10 years. Um, so the, the fact is that um, uh, even it was hard for tourists to go there. I think you could only get a one week visa, a two week visa maximum until 10 years ago uh, and so on. It's only in the last 10 years that uh, the Burmese themselves have been exposed in a big way to world currents and uh, an open world of media and newspaper uh, and social media, which has been very, very important. Um, and so what's interesting to me and kind of surprising is that a country that has so little, if you like, democratic practice, and what democratic practices has had has only been since 2011, um, uh, although there was a big uprising, there was an election in 1990 um, uh, after an uprising in 1988, but that was the, more about questions of inflation. In any case, it surprised me that the reaction to the military coup was so massive and concentrated in this population between 15 and 35 by and large, um, who went out into the streets and who didn't have lessons, long lessons in nonviolent resistance, although Aung San Suu Kyi is a aficionado of Gandhi and, uh, and Martin Luther King. So it's not as if they're completely innocent of these, but it's been the largest nonviolent democratic movement I think we've seen in decades and inspiring in terms of its creativity as well in, a, in hundreds of ways. Um, I used to think that the Hong Kong protesters had uh, essentially created a new repertoire uh, for nonviolent protests, democracy protests. But I think the Burmese have outdone them, right, uh, over the past two months. And I don't know how this is going to turn out because as you've noticed, unlike Hong Kong, this is a military that is actually executing 
right? With snipers and so on, uh, protesters by shooting them in the head and the chest uh, and essentially, essentially murdering them um, as a form of intimidation. And that is something that they learn to do in repressing all of the minority groups like the Rohingya, for example, uh, but also the Karen and Kachin. So now the Burmese public is experiencing what the ethnic minorities have been experiencing for the last three or four decades. That's 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 a haunting observation that 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 I did not know. Um, uh, I'm trying to understand why the reaction to what's going on in the country has been so muted, um, and why actually I don't think you know most people, even most very politically clued in people, are aware of the extent of democratic resistance that is going on at the moment. Um, I think beyond the reason that I outlined earlier, which is that it's just a country that. Um, even a lot of journalists, a lot of politicians don't know very much about. Um, there's perhaps two elements. Um, you know, one is that Aung San Suu Kyi, the democratic leader, is seen as having been complicit in the persecution of Rohingya and other minorities. And so there isn't an easy story of a hero and a villain, which often exists at least as long as people have been in the opposition. Um, it's easy to uh, uh, think that uh, democratic <laughs> leaders are heroes. And then, Sometimes when they get into office, they turn out not to be quite so heroic. But normally at this point of a struggle, there is a kind of easy hero and villain narrative, and that doesn't exist in Burma at the moment. And the second reason, perhaps, is that it just um, seems uh, from the outside relatively unlikely that the democratic movement will succeed, but it seems like this is a relatively unified uh, military uh, regime. Um, that is willing, as you pointed out, to use tremendous violence and force against its own population. And so the prospects of success seem quite dire. Um, why do you think we should care uh, about this democracy movement, um, uh, despite Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, complicated role in the persecution of Rohingya? And do you think there's reason to be more optimistic about its long-term success um, than, uh, than many people perhaps assume? So to begin with Aung San Suu Kyi, um, it's true um, uh, that uh, she was complicit in the repression of the Rohingya. Um, and unfortunately that did not cost her a great deal within Burma. Um, there's a great deal of hatred for uh, Islam um, that's widely shared in the population. Uh, and although some of the protesters have gone out of their way to apologize to the Rohingya, right, in the last couple of weeks, um, the fact is that uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's international image has been tarnished forever. Um, but her image in the country is still as the um, democracy lady who won the recent elections by a landslide even bigger than before the Rohingya events and so on. So she remains, uh, it hasn't cost her anything in Burma. And some people, I don't believe this, but some people believe that she was playing a long game in order to get the constitution changed and did not want to royal the military um, uh, and that she actually was against what happened to the Rohingya. I don't believe that that's true. Or I think we have no evidence that says it's true. So the question is, um, your point about the military, the military is unbelievably isolated in its own self-contained economy. That is, uh, the soldiers live in barracks, they have their own housing, they have their own food supply, they have their own schools, they have their own hospitals. They, so they are insulated almost entirely from the civilian population. And the new capital, speaking of Brasilia, Naypyidaw, is a capital where the military elite now is out of not in Mandalay or in Rangoon, but in their own little Brasilia, that was just built in the last 10 years uh, and isolated uh, as well. Uh, so that I think the, the, the pessimistic predictions uh, that you 
um, referred to uh, are probably fairly accurate. I don't see much uh, in the way of evidence that the military will crack or fracture, uh, although some of the police have gone over to the uh, protesters. What has happened, however, is that this is a military that has lost every last shred of legitimacy that it ever had for virtually all Burmese, right? Uh, and so if it continues, continues to rule, it continues to rule just by brute force uh, as a hated institution. It doesn't, it had a certain amount of nationalist backing historically. Now it's just the army. Um, and so um, the question is, um, will it eventually crack? Uh, I mean, I, I think your pessimistic reading is probably the correct one that the army has more bullets than the population has bodies um, and that um, uh, it's likely to end badly and people will have to slink back to their houses and try to survive or run to Thailand and so on. In fact, we're trying to organize a program for endangered scholars uh, who are in hiding now and hope to get to Thailand uh, along the lines of what was done for the uh, Chileans um, in the 70s uh, after Allende was uh, assassinated. Yeah, and we'll um, put a link to uh, to that initiative in the show notes. Um, uh, that, that seems like one important way of at least concretely helping particular people and particular scholars who are endangered uh, in the country and it's admirable that you're standing this up. Um, let me uh, close off this conversation with a broad question, which is that I'm still trying to digest um, the implications of all of your work for how, how to think about politics today. And I know that that is a very big question, um, but it's one that I've grappled with reading your work, which has changed the way that I see the world, uh, which has uh, made me uncomfortable with many of the assumptions I used to have, which I find persuasive in many ways. Um, but when it comes to the sort of upshot, I sometimes get a little bit stuck um, precisely because we do live in these complicated modern states. It seems impossible not to do any planning at all. Uh, we both, as you've made very amply evident in the context of Myanmar, care about uh, values like democracy. Um, so, so how do you take the anarchist critique of the worst aspects of a modern state and channeled into a productive politics where you can nevertheless go out in the world and try and fight uh, for some of the values, uh, like making sure that the poor people uh, in the world have better standards of living, like making sure uh, that we have democracy and, 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 and rights and freedoms for most people. Um, uh, what to change about the political practice of those who share those values um, if they take the, the lessons of your work seriously? So it's not as if I have, um, I puzzle over these same things as uh, you puzzle over them. It's not as if I have some uh, straightforward answer. And so in the book, Two Cheers for Anarchism, I make it clear that um, we're unlikely to get rid of the Westphalian state. That is the form of rule that uh, we are more or less cursed or blessed with. Um, and so the, the idea of uh, the anarchist vision of um, uh, getting rid of the state uh, is uh, hopelessly utopian. Um, uh, and our job is to domesticate the state, if you like, right? Uh, and I'm not very optimistic that we'll be able to. Right, um, and uh, and um, although you know there's there are states that are more or less admirable, right, uh, in terms of the degree of freedom that they afford their population and the degree of access to sort of popular dissent and complaints and uh, and so on. Um, in which you know if if we've got to have states, let's have social democratic states with functioning democracies and a welfare state. Um, however, if you step back from that and widen the lens uh, much more than we have, then 
all of these states that we admire, uh, mostly Western states, um, they have gotten where they've gotten by plundering the resources of the world, right? Uh, for industrial growth uh, in a way that seems completely unsustainable. So if you like the damage, if you like the, the what's the collateral damage of Western economic growth on resources, um, uh, CO2 in the air, um, forms of bondage in the third world and in mines and, um, and so on, plantations and so on. It's not a pretty picture of, if you like, the substructure or infrastructure of successful capitalist development, even when it's in a political form that we is relatively admirable compared to other forms. So um, I'm, at, it, when you open the lens that wide, I've become a true pessimist, I'm afraid. Well, on this uplifting note, um, <laughs> Jim Scott, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And the, the site, by the way, is Mutual Aid Myanmar for people who want to help the Myanmar Democratic Forces uh, on the web. I'll send you the link. Wonderful. So Mutual Aid Myanmar, and we'll send that in the right. uh, show links as well. Thank you so much. Uh, you bet. My pleasure.